Hello there everyone. As part of our launch of the NCT Data Global Outlook Report, I'm delighted to act as the moderator for our roundtable today, focused on the commercial and specialty market, where we discuss some of the key findings from this fifth um, InsureTech report. And post-COVID, this, is, this one is particularly interesting on in how investment has actually been affected. So I'm Deborah Bale, I'm director here at NCT Data, and I'd like to introduce our esteemed guests who bring a wealth of experience across InsureTechs, being involved in their own organisations, contribution to ensure te- both on the technology and on the people standpoint, and also from a startup perspective. I'd like to introduce you to uh, Paolo Como. So Paolo uh, is the the head, um, of the, sorry, the director of operations at Brit. We also have the pleasure of welcoming Sylvie Wonka Sinclair, who's the group head of port, um, portfolio underwriting, and Matt McGrillis, who's the CTO and co-founder of Send. So before we start to get to the chat, I'd like to present some of the topics and extracts from the report, which you can download from our website, insuretech.insurance.nttdata.com. So what what have we found coming from the report? So in commercial, what we can really be sure of is that switching to digital services uh, will enhance the overall business. However, we still need to bear in mind that the offline agents and brokers remain very relevant and given the complexity and flexibility of the commercial products, this still needs to have a mechanism in the market. The pandemic itself has increased the pressure of macro variables and new lines of business. So business uh, such as business operation disruption or risk aversion and low economic growth, these are increasing in the price uh, and increasing the prices of the, the commercial products themselves. We can, however, take advantage and leverage new data sources and technologies. So for example, AI and drones, IoT, telematics, these are all improving the underwriting and claims customer experience. And we have um, examples and use cases such as Sake case, which is an IoT, um, AI, Everest and NTD data initiative itself that actually enhances safety in the workplace. The, the final one on that aspect is cloud and cybersecurity. So accelerated by the pandemic and millions of us working from home, the commercial covers in this area actually met new levels of uh, demands. In the area of the specialty lines, the niche demands that we saw here were synonymous of how we interact with brands online. So services related to new customer demands can enhance how they perceive a company, for example, and connected specialty lines that are offer that commercial to offer a much more complete coverage and customized products for our customers. So the speed to go to market, high technology uh, adoption and industry knowledge is really essential to meet these commercial demands. And the specialty lines themselves are a trend uh, that are able to explore new markets and enter new sectors at a rapid pace. These new and emerging markets require the adoption of new technologies and particularly in new risk models as well. What we have here is an example of um, some opportunities and channel, uh, challenges uh, for the B2B market due to the digitization and new demands. We're moving into uh, the, the next aspect, which is uh, just highlighting one of those key t- these in startups that we talked about earlier, which is key insurance. So key is the first fully digital and algorithmically driven Lloyds of London syndicate, and that's offering instant capacity and access- that's accessible anywhere at any time, definitely what the market is needing at this stage. The algorithm itself will be used to evaluate Lloyds policies and will automatically quote for business through a digital platform that brokers can access directly themselves. And the selection process is performed using a proprietary algorithm developed with the support of University College London and their their computer science department. Key offers brokers align on every risk in the selected classes led by these markets. And its aim is to significantly reduce the amount of time and effort taken for brokers to, to to place and follow their capacity, creating much, much more greater efficiency and responsiveness and competitiveness in the market. My first question is, one of the key findings of the report is that despite COVID-19 investment in InsureTech being at second highest level, like most of the average funding per deal that actually took a hit, most average funding per deal took a hit in um, the first quarter of 2020, um, uncertainty, but then it actually shot to its highest level on record. Sylvie, from your perspective, do you think that the initial uncertainty um, of COVID impact 
has actually made technological innovation a real top priority? Yeah, so I would say a resounding yes um, to that question. Um, I think it's a little bit a question of probably what players in the market you look at. But if I generalize wildly, I would say yes. And that's on the basis of necessity being the mother of all invention. And so what is it that has changed and made this more relevant? So I think firstly, it's a question of changed behaviors where basically the whole of the developed world went literally online overnight, um, pushing for development in months, what would otherwise have taken years or even decades um, mm -hmm. to achieve. I mean, look, even Lloyd's all of a sudden managed without their in-person trading room, lo and behold. And, you know, the insurance industry needs to adapt like everyone else. Um, in addition to that, I, you know, if, if we look at the, the pressure to reduce costs, so I think it's no secret that the pandemic has hit the, the P&Ls of, of most companies, not only in insurance. Um, and so cost efficiency, although it's already, you know, been on the agenda for many years, I think has just taken another leap up to, to the top. So in summary, a big yes. Thank you for that. Paolo, from your perspective, what are you seeing or your thoughts? Well, I'd like to take a, a slightly contrarian view. Um, you know, I believe that, yes, the, the chaos of COVID has forced people to, to behave differently. But I think in essence, while staff at every level of every organisation have realised the, the opportunities and importance of technology, my sense from a priority point of view is those companies who were prioritising technology beforehand have sort of realize that yes, they're doing the right thing and they will push it even harder. Whilst you know, those leaders who maybe weren't really convinced to, about technology will have seen the practical things. Oh, you know, yes, if, if we had a better VC tool, those first few months might have been less painful or, you know, um, uh, uh, are we managing to email large documents around? Um, and yeah, the way we have interacted has changed. You know, who would have thought that the the biggest driver to realizing you can review documents on, on a screen is that you have to pay for your own printer ink, right? So, um, you know, there will be some things that don't change in from that point of view. But fundamentally, I think as we return to um, a, a more traditional way of working in the, over the next few months, we will see that those technology innovators will accelerate out, but the technology laggards, I'm not sure, will actually necessarily pick up space. So, We'll see people talking about it more, um, but is it just going to be a veneer? If I can misquote my um, Intech London co-founder, Robin Mertens, you know, are, are people simply going to be putting digital lipstick on their legacy pig? I love the lipstick on a pig scenario. We use it often, and I love seeing them with a lipstick on a pig T-shirt. That, <laughs> that was a fun day. So thank you. Thank you for that. So the, the report shows that the UK is the second largest investor in insurtech. However, the difference between the US and Europe is, is, mon is still massively different. But there's notable exceptions. And as I mentioned earlier, the first fully digital um, and algorithmic driven London Lloyd Syndicate, which is key, closed the 500 million um, in 2020. Or WeFox, for example, that's recently raised the highest funding with 650 million led by Target Global and Mundi Ventures. So, Paolo, obviously there's some element of connection there, but what, what do you see, or do you think we'll see much more investment in techs in London to drive modernisation? Or do you still think that that very manual, complicated nature of the business um, written um, is an insurmountable barrier to entry? So what's your thoughts on that? Sure, so to, to answer two, almost two different questions there. One is, the, the only way that technology startups can, can change insurance or technology driven startups, I should say, can change to, uh, insurance is if they become large. I mean, it's, um, you know, without a doubt, an idea like Key is excellent. If it was writing $20 million of, of business, it wouldn't be driving the change it does. Similarly, WeFox or the recent fantastic success are bought by many. It's only when these companies receive the investment that allows them to scale. And they, by that point, of course, they're no longer startups. They, you know, they're proper proven companies in their own right. But it's only at that scale that the incumbents then start to think, okay, you know, what do we need to do? You know, how do we compete? How do we copy, et cetera? So, um, you know, if we don't continue to see that scale of, of investment, then we won't continue to see the, 
the extent of innovation. I mean, if we look then specifically at, uh, at the Lloyds and the future of Lloyds situation, now, now if someone's going to spend a, a nine-figure sum in modernizing the market, and I think everyone's fully aligned that it's the right thing to do, so we've yeah. moved beyond that to saying, yes, we must do this. The question then becomes, you know, uh, who, who can benefit? Um, and at one level, if that much is being spent, then surely every little insure tech can get a little bit of a pie. But in, in reality, when you're making a, a change that's that big, what you cannot do, whether it's at Lloyd's or the digital transformations in any of the individual insurers or, or brokers, you can't work with too many partners. So, you know, it, however much I may have 10 stakeholders in my organization who want to work with 10 best of breed insure techs, that's a nightmare for me. You know, it's far better if I can find two or three companies who may not be quite so excellent in each of those 10 areas, but then suddenly I'm only needing to work with two or three companies. That's easier for me. So, you know, the insure techs have not just got to have a good idea, not just got to work out which door to knock on, but they've also got to work out how can they avoid being too niche because that's very tricky to work with too many niche ideas. Mm. Yeah. So we what's your thoughts? Yeah, so, so if I look at it more from a, a sort of market perspective, be that Lloyd's or even a, a sort of a large reinsurer um, for that matter, I think no matter how manual or complicated a business is, I think there are always parts that can benefit from automation and, and machine assistance, you know, be that submission evaluation or extraction of information, wording control. So, so I think the, the, the barriers, yes, um, and we're going to come to the topic of culture, I guess, in a while. But, but yes, the barriers are there. But I think, you know, you may not have to put them up quite as high because I think you can make smaller gains without necessarily doing everything in one go. And just a comment on Lloyd's. I mean, I think if, if Lloyd's as a market truly wants to be on the playing field as a competitive international marketplace, I just think it has to consider some of these elements because it has to do with with cost efficiency as well, in addition to ease of doing business. So, yep, I, I think there is stuff to do. Yeah, absolutely. Matt, from uh, obviously you're coming at it from a different perspective. So your thoughts in terms of uh, those comments? Yeah, I mean, it's a really exciting time for the market, I think, in terms of uh, in terms of InsureTech. But we at Send are really supportive of the Lloyds and Blueprint too. And it's ambition, I guess, to be the most advanced insurance marketplace. It, you know, good question. How are to those traditional in, in, insurers responding to that? I mean, we're speaking to a lot of CIOs and I think they really fall into two categories you know you've got the the first category that is really hesitant you know that i guess we've seen it all before brigade um they're really waiting to see what happens seeing the direction of the travel seeing the success and the update of the initiatives you, then you, you know you have on the flip side got the more innovative uh, insurers that are out there in the market that are kind of countering those risks and uncertainties by really considering flexible solutions you know, more than ever kind of SaaS solutions, solutions that are kind of built for built for change, often cloud first solutions um, that, that, um, that, that are suddenly uh, kind of gaining traction from, you know, previously uh, a, a lot of old technology that is, that is still around the market. So, I, I mean, I guess that's our perspective. Mm. Does anyone think there's an appetite for our share of the investment to actually increase and give the US a run for their money? <laughs> if, if I might, I mean, this is a, uh, an eternal question and certainly with one we talked about a lot in the insure tech space a few years ago and it was nascent and I'm seeing a very similar question in, in the quantum computing space, which is an area I'm looking at um, currently. The, the, the mindset, the psyche of investment in, in, in the US and the UK is different and I, it, it's so mm -hmm. fundamentally different that I don't think we can say all oh, you know, how can the UK emulate, you know, that's a multi-year journey deep in terms of the, the thinking of, um, of, of individuals, the whole sort of concept of, you know, what it means to lose money, etc. So uh, we're, we're, we're never going to give the US the run for the money at their own game. I think London, in terms of the ecosystem that it, it has, in insurance generally, and then in terms of the, the, the fintech and sure tech intersection, with the insurance space is unparalleled. So 
if we can continue to make sure that new innovative insurance ideas can work with the established insurance firm, the whole of the ecosystem, then we can uh, we can beat anyone in the world, thank you. Yeah, absolutely, great point there. Um, following on, the, the report itself identifies the IoT as the highest growing um, technology of the technologies in 2020, and smart mobility itself one of the main areas for innovation. But because of the, co the impact of COVID, um, is that because of the impact of COVID so far? We don't know. So, but what we've seen is smart mobility in the context of micro mobility, shared, um, shared and driverless cars, uh, or new uses based, based policy, sorry, policies in, a, in, in this time where we actually can't travel or the cars remain in, uh, in the garage at home and so forth. But there are other important um, opportunities in the commercial lines themselves with this parametric insurance coming in place. So an example amongst many, many others is um, at NCT Data, we have actually delivered a smart shipments um, tracking device. And uh, in similar lines with Parcel, this device currently is, is in use tracking the likes of tuna or wine. And we all want that to arrive at its destination and its finest um, uh, perception for sure. But how close are we to seeing some similar innovation in commercial insurance um, for example, in, in cargo and actually beyond. So, Sylvie, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I think parametric is one of my passions. So, look, I, I think there's a lot of innovation in parametric insurance already being in the commercial and specialty place. And I think it's one of the hotter areas for, for venture capital investors as well, because it's you know, it's, it's quite cost efficient and very sort of data led in, it, in its existence. And, and I think personally also, it's, it's probably one of the, the areas that will allow the insurance industry to, to regain some of its lost relevance to kind of society at large, if we think of, of um, you know, catastrophe covers and so on that are made increasingly parametric. If I just look at sort of beyond cargo in the in the here and now, I think you know we see examples when it comes to flood, to to various kinds of agriculture perspective or protection, um, the commodity space, um, so protecting against uh, price movement risk in commodities, but also really looking at sort of traditional property where you have sensors checking for potential breakdowns that can actually Mm -hmm. um, help mitigate that risk and also pay compensation. So I don't doubt the, the innovation per se. I think for me, a bigger question is whether us as the, the industry and especially the more traditional part of it, are we sort of, are we actually understanding? Can we ingest and do something meaningful to the data that is indeed coming out of these solutions? Um, I'm not entirely yet convinced of, of that response, but I remain hopeful. Mm. Great response. Paolo, from your side? Um, so I would I'd absolutely agree with Sylvie that, that there's potential and to, to think about a few aspects. I mean, firstly, on the IoT side, yeah, in, in, inherently everyone knows that, that uh, an insurer doesn't want to claim and an insurer would prefer not to, to need to receive a claim. And therefore, if you look at the, the role of IoT, it, in, in many different ways, it can make a real difference when it comes to risk reduction. So, you know, if we take the cargo side, um, yes, IoT showing where in the journey something was dropped is valuable when it comes to saying, okay, therefore whose fault was it? It's even more valuable, frankly, in terms of saying, okay, do we see a pattern here? You know, do, do, these, do these goods regularly get damaged in this port? Or you know, do we see um, this fruit regularly going off on this particular bit of the voyage? And then what you can do is you can work with that data to reduce the occurrence of claims. And that's a, a, a classic win-win. If, if we think about the, the driving the telematics space, I remember a discussion with the, uh, um, the CEO of a telematics startup aimed at fleet drivers. And I said to him, look, how does your algorithm actually help decide the optimal price based on driving. He said, look, it doesn't, that's not the intent. He said, my intent is to show the fleet managers who are the five or 10% worst drivers, tell them to fix that, otherwise they won't be covered under the fleet policy. And then suddenly the overall risk goes down. And so, so I think you know, we, we need to look at this ever increasing volume of data on IoT 
um, as a, a, a true sort of source of win-win opportunity for the insureds and for the insurers. Are you seeing anything from your side, Matt? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, couldn't agree more with the guys. I mean, data these days is, is omnipresent. There's a huge number of providers that are either in the market already that, uh, you know, that have data sources that are making them making the data more accessible via APIs. And that obviously the new players in the market, uh, you know, IoT and other, that, that you know, previously um, uh, data that was unreachable or, or wasn't there is suddenly coming to market. So really, really competitive market. Um, it's really, you know, easier than ever to get hold of the data. Sylvie's point about, about the challenges was really, uh, I think, valid. And we see it a lot. There's, um, there's so many options that people are often snow blind in terms of making the decisions because there are so many different data options. And I guess at Send, we spend an awful lot of time um, from a UX perspective, trying to surface the data in, in relevant ways. So, you, you know, often systems at the moment that, that may be incumbent legacy systems, it's very hard to bring all of that data into those in, in, in an easy way. But um, obviously, it, you know, for, for a new system, it, you know, which is um, based on connectivity first, it's, it's a lot obviously easier to access it but surfacing the data, presenting it in a way that's really usable to the people that actually need it to make the decisions is so important. It's where we spend a huge amount of energy. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we all recognise it's not just about having all that data available to you, it's what you're actually going to do with it. Um, how do you get it to the right user at the right time? If, if, if I might, on, on that point, and just building on, on, on Sylvie's point about social relevance and the potential of parametrics to that, I think it's it's always worth bringing up an example that I know we've all heard several times by now, but it's just so, so important as we think about insurance for social good. So micro crop insurance is only possible through a combination of a number of technologies, parametric technology, the concept of parametric insurance, the, the use of satellite um, imagery and various other satellite based measurements around um, uh, wind speed, around heat, around um, uh, rainfall, etc. So, yeah, so the idea that you can take your claims handling costs essentially to zero, thereby allowing a, a, a farmer, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in Asia, who um, is not, you know, is paying a premium that's measured in tens of dollars. And so the moment there was a claims handling cost on that, you know, the economic wouldn't make sense. But if the claims handling is all automatic, there is less than a certain amount of rainfall, or there is more than a certain amount of rainfall, we make a direct payment out. That is, is genuinely invaluable for the people who want to buy that. And it's something that just a few years ago would not have technically been something insurers could offer. So yeah, that, there are some fantastic examples like that that we really need to make sure we're, we're both encouraging everyone to get involved in and then broadcasting the success of them. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of the, uh, the, the next point uh, in the field of distribution itself, and there's much, there's many large and powerful initiatives that are coming into play in 2020. Among one of them, it's probably worth noting um, the, the launch of Chubb Studio. So the studio itself, it, it defines itself as a, as a digital insurance in a box and offers more than 600 partners around the world, initially in Asia and Latin America, the ability to, to introduce policies in their channels in the most simplest may, way and the most integrated way. Um, so we're still to see that that um, Chubb Studio expand into Europe. So we're seeing large and established insurers creating innovative uh, innovation solutions. Do you think there's a a real future for commercial insurance, or do you think this will also always be a, a space for the, the much more traditional face to face approach um, with with these insurers and brokers? Matt, do you want to answer on that one? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, at Send, we really believe, you know, that underwriting is an art and a science and, and there's always going to be a balance, we think. Um, now, obviously, science, as we spoke about, all of these different amazing data sources that, you know, can then bring in things like a AI and machine learning. I mean, again, you know, that kind of digital first, you know, aspirations of everyone is super important as well. But, you know, then going back to the art side, the, the decisions need to be made quickly. Um, so, and, and really, we feel certainly at the moment that gut instincts are a really big part of underwriting. 
So I guess at Send, we really look at it like that and kind of try and build tools to kind of validate that uh, and kind of back that up. And I guess an example of that is, um, is looking at the kind of submission to bind workflow. Uh, and what we've really tried to do is, is build up a, a new type of workflow engine from, from the ground up, I guess, that is a lot more what we call non-linear non workflow that, that really is more optimized to the conversational nature of, uh, of, of the way that we do business in, in commercial insurance. Um, another example is, is, you know, all of that data, but it's all about getting the data um, in front of the right people at the right time. So, you know, we really focus on getting that data, which is often in unstructured form still, getting it cleaned up and uh, and then obviously using all of these great um, data providers to provide enhanced data on risk to give that information um, to uh, the underwriters up front when they need it um, at the point of pricing rather than having to, I guess, rely on reinsurance uh, in order to kind of tidy up any mistakes, which obviously has an impact on the profitability. So I guess in terms of back to that art and science, we really believe um, putting in flexibility uh, and, and, and the ability to, to change regularly is the way forward. We think kind of those traditional ways of, you know, getting a chunk of money to do a big transformation program, maybe is not the way forward anymore. Really try focusing more on agile, what we call continuous transformations, maybe like taking smaller bites of the apple, but really refining and refining and refining all of the time. So that, that's the way the approach that we do. And, and obviously these new um, uh, insure techs that, that have the ability uh, and the framework of, uh, of the ability to have those um, tech that can support that is, is obviously a huge advantage. So, I mean, it, it's an exciting place for, for insure techs. Yeah, absolutely. So Paolo, what's your thoughts in terms of that real-time data to the, to the right user to make those timely decisions? Or anything additional you'd like to add to what Matt's mentioning? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there's two ways of looking at this, right? One is uh, the, the more data you have in a more real-time manner, that, that's got to be good. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, complex commercial insurance policies are still written for a 12-month period and are a result of many weeks of discussion before they're written or before the renewal. So, um, you know, you, you, you could say it's absolutely the way we've all got to go or you could say well you know it's it's completely irrelevant and um that's why you know faith to faith will continue for a while i mean i think the 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 way i look at it and i have a, a colleague of mine billy who draws this as a, a very nice diagram which i'm going to totally fail to explain but essentially he draws it as a trapezium and and the back of the trapezium are those essentially commoditized products where uh, a specialty insurer is going to be less interested because it's just about using that data, doing it quickly. Um, and um, yeah, it's all about cost, all about speed. And, and that's where you need a certain type of data. And then on the forward leaning edge of the trapezium is that sort of mouse that's searching for, for the new previously uninsured products. Either people had never thought to insure them, they're completely new risks, or maybe the data wasn't previously available. Now, trying to automate and rush any of that is, you know, is going to lead to disaster. These are completely poorly understood risks. And therefore, the best you can do is take together the, the experts who have got 20 or 30 years of experience to use an inadequate amount of data to make a decision. And then what happens, of course, is over the next two, five, 10, 20 years, they move along the, the trapezium until they become commoditized in turn and that's where speed and volume of data works. And if we think about it like that, then we can see that the dichotomy of do we want lots of fast real time data um, or do we want slow, thoughtful face to face? Actually, both of them play a role. And um, we should absolutely be saying that it's success if we continue to have both models. Yeah, that's a great point. Sylvie, anything to add? Yeah, I just maybe like to highlight the consumer angle to this because I, I think consumer behaviors are changing and I think people sort of prefer now to buy insurance more in an ecosystem as opposed to calling up a separate insurer and asking for a policy. 
And I mean, those consumers will also lead commercial companies who will buy insurance in their turn. Um, and I think so, so I think that consumer behavior is, is most likely going to repeat itself, not not tomorrow, but over time, also in the commercial space. And I'm also thinking as as you know, the 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 traditional insurance industry turns more and more to to the uh, SME space, I think we will you know, the relevance of having an ecosystem thinking um, will be stronger and stronger. And, you know, Swiss Re, where I've, I've been working for a while now, has, has had its IPTQ platform up and running for a long time, where, where the business logic is exactly this. You don't sell it yourself. You sell it in a place that has more relevance to, to the customer in question. So, yep, that's my perspective. I think that leads nicely on to the next point in terms of in every uh, every aspect of our lives uh, day to day, we all looking for that instant gratification, aren't we? So and the insurance business is definitely no exception to that. So despite being hampered with the legacy millstone that we see on a regular basis around the next, my question is probably to Matt. What are the startups actually doing that can help transform the market and reduce the reliance on these Massive monolithic systems that are that seem to be constraining a lot certainly a lot of our customers today yeah i'm sure yeah that's what we're here as well and i, I guess at saying we really try and look at this differently you know it it's obvious and completely understandable that, that the established players um with the legacy they need and they need the same agility mm -hmm. as say in the unencumbered startups that are, that are coming to the market um the issue is legacy is at the core of their business. They've invested huge amounts and, you know, suggesting rip and replace is a, is a really super scary thing to take on and comes with it risk because it is the core of the business. So I guess an example of that is, is um, you know, what we try to do is try to introduce tech that, that works around it. And an example of that is, is probably our, our underwriting workbench product that, that, that we've deployed at some major uh, insurers in the market. They're in almost like a strange predicament. They're, they're, in, com they're in conflict, that, they're, that they are burdened by operational uh, processes that have lots of rekeying and, and siloed legacy, but you know, they are, uh, they do want to keep some of that investment that and that core functions and and some of the integration and plumbing that they've spent a lot of money on. So I guess through that workbench, I guess we really feel that we're or well, they're feeling that they're kind of liberated from that because some of the tech and, and the functions like workflow and document generation, submission management, rating and that data wrangling and making sense of the data is it's really um taking that away from legacy to keep legacy really in its kind of core function keep legacy the, the legacy implementations simple and uh, and 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 any new uh, agile um, implementations and you know that continuous transformation we would do outside so so build up in those more agile insure tech platforms that really are built for that speed of change Paolo, I can see you agreeing um, here with Matt. Is there something that you want to do add to that? Um, I'd, I'd fully agree with you. Can I, can I do that very naughty thing of extrapolating an anecdote off one point of personal experience and then we can even <laughs> agree whether or not it's worth it? But um, yeah, it's incredibly challenging being a, an insurer with you know the legacy stack and all, all the challenges mm -hmm. it brings. And then you've got everyone around you showing you all these new shiny things um, and you get jealous. But the other day I received a a letter from my car insurer to my address, postal letter, they said, you know, we also offer home insurance. Houses in this area can get household insurance for 350 pounds. Why not find out more? And it gave me a generic web address. And I'm thinking, okay, you know my address by definition, I've shared that with you. You can go on to, to Zoopla, Rightmove, whatever it might be. You can understand how much the house cost when it was bought. You can probably scrape that website to find out more or less how many rooms it has and various bits of information completely essentially for free. You therefore have a pretty good idea already of my property. And you certainly, you know, even if you don't want to state a, a quote number in the letter, you can at least show that you understand my property. So I'm thinking to some extent, 
we see some legacy players being their own worst enemies which is that they're, they're striving for, for, you know, oh, let's set up an innovation department or let's do something completely new. When in fact, what they might start with is just saying, how can we use some of the, the changing world of tech and data to do what we do currently a little bit better? Thank you for that. Anything from you, Sylvie? Yeah, so look, I, I've, I guess I've always thought about sort of change and, and what, what uh, matters to change. And I guess it's, it's rarely the tech itself it's it's yeah. often the uh, the people more than more than anything and and i think the the pandemic has helped um i think it has sort of shown that things can be done differently um i think we should also remember that you know as as much as we now think oh my god this is happening to insurance and we're alone in experiencing this you know our cousins in banking or investment management you know they were through this 10 15 years ago so you know somebody has already been on this journey so i think we can kind of calm down a little bit but i guess you know talking about barriers i think in my experience i've i've seen two things that that sort of stand out a little bit for insurance and I guess the first thing is 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 a mindset that maybe comes from and I would say especially you know maybe the the commercial side of insurance which is has been rather isolated from consumer business and therefore hasn't necessarily felt the pressures that you know more consumer adjacent businesses would and you just have this kind of mindset of if it ain't broken why should I fix it and that's been okay for for a long long time um I think another angle and, and related to the first bit is that the talent question. And, and I guess the insurance industry hasn't been the best at attracting data engineers and data mm -hmm. scientists, um, rather focusing on more sort of traditional profiles. And I think that is that is really a scarce resource that we have to sort of, you know, scratch our heads on and figure out how do we do that? Because without these people, without the talent, the journey will be a lot tougher and will take a lot longer. So, um, yeah, a reconsideration of talent to attract is a, yeah. a key one. That That is absolutely one of the key challenges of my job on a day-to-day -day basis is the talent and actually bring in the right individuals with the right mindset and the right attitude in order to deliver what our customers uh, need uh, in aspect. So I'll probably end with culture. So Matt, what barriers um, to entry do you actually see startups to engage in the market? Mainly the startups like yourself are technologists. And I'm not just um, tarring you with one brush as being a technologist, but typically um, it, could, it can be difficult for you to get engaged into an organization. And, and sometimes the startups are lacking in in lacking in the skills to actually manoeuvre around those really highly governed environments. So what do you think we can, we as an organ or as an industry can do to actually help startups move much more agilely? You know, um, two years ago, I guess prior to the pandemic, the, the CEOs that we were talking to often complained, I guess, that they met resistance to, to change of, of tech that they really felt would be helpful. Um, but there was resistance by the by the business to I, I guess changing changing the way that they were operating at the minute I mean obviously a pandemic post that has, has, has changed everything has brought you know in a real change management revolution I mean the challenges from everyone all of a sudden working from home you know challenges around the management of working tra challenges around tracking that work and collaborating technology helps some, fill some of that those gaps and I guess it really kind of uh, kick-started um, some of those some of those changes and 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 obviously the, the data gained by some of these solutions to help track some of those work also helped um, you know the the, the the standard governments that they uh, governance that they've got to put in in order to, to maintain you know the, the 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 regulatory requirements of you know doing sanctions checks and checking out the, the customers I think you know in, in terms of insure tech and how things are changing I, we think like initiatives like uh, future at Lloyd's and encouraging startups, um, you know, break through and breaking down those barriers, uh, you know, they're, they're hugely uh, useful. Speaking as Ascend and I guess our, our journey, um, you know, I guess we had barriers like 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 every startup, you know, the, the difficult first big customer to, 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 to get those on board. Um, you know, 
fortunately for us, we had you know a, a quite an exciting product um, that that I that I guess our customers saw and really bought into. I guess you know advice for for startups coming into the market. I think it's so important um, that that in, that the technology companies need to speak to insurers and brokers in their own language. It's that kind of deep market experience is more than any field uh, and market art that I've worked in and I've worked across banking and government. It's this more than anything. It's you need to speak the language of insurance. So, I mean, I would say to the, to, to, to those um, startups that are just starting, build up that knowledge or, or take on people that have that knowledge to be able to frame um, your proposition uh, in, in the right way. Yeah, I think that brings us back nicely to something Paolo mentioned earlier about preference to work with a smaller subset of these uh, these new niche organisations or startups that are coming into the market because it is a bit of a nightmare to actually have to work with so many at the same time. But Paolo, what advice would you give to startups in order for them to actually be able to engage further than what Matt ha has mentioned? Thank you. So, uh, yes, absolutely, they they need to, to speak the language and to some extent we haven't really touched much on the Lloyd's Lab but I think we should remind ourselves that the Lloyd's Lab which for those of us in EC3 is now part of the part of the scenery was a new idea just you know uh, I guess three years ago um, and you know a, a huge element of its success is that it has helped the startups who joined the lab rapidly learn the language so when they did go and, and, and meet with factories and underwriters etc they, they, there wasn't that inefficiency of speaking two different languages so, so so that's been successful so i'd suggest to any startup you know as you look to the you know dozens of different accelerators that are out there that you might join they all offer something different some of the money some of them expertise etc but you know if you're looking at it from an insurance point of view and you don't have a team that has a lot of insurance experience make sure you're picking a a home that can educate you there um i think on the other side though it's it's incumbent upon the large firms to also make an effort and again you know four or five years ago no one really had an innovation lab or head of innovation and everything now everyone tends to have them now there's a lot of you know sort of just bandwagon hopping there etc but ultimately at least what it has done is it's meant there's someone in the organization who needs to explain to the executives what does agile mean what does a pilot mean what's the proof of concept because again it, it might seem daft to many of the people on this call but you know if, if we picked a uh, an average insurance executive just a few years back and and use the term proof of concept or the term agile they would have looked utterly confused and we know we, we're well down that road but we're only a small part and the, the, the final thing to add in that context is um we at brit are, are proud to have just signed the fintech pledge which is something that that the insure tech board which is part of the fintech delivery panel has done a lot of work with the banks and is now trying to bring into insurance and essentially what the, the FinTech pledge says is that we as the large incumbent will do our best to not make things unnecessarily difficult for a startup. Because if I take three months to decide whether or not I like the outcome of the proof of concept, frankly, that makes no difference to me working the large insurance company. You know, if you're the startup who just put a bunch of work into that and are desperate for some money to keep you going, a, a, a quick no is as valuable to the a drawn out yet. Thank you. Sylvie, any final thoughts from you on that topic? Yeah, I, I would love to, to just elaborate a bit on what Paolo said. So I think the language is one thing, but also this notion of the cultural difference between entrepreneurialism and a corporate mindset to understand that and sort of prepare oneself mentally for the sometimes very long sales cycles that you can see in, in insurance. But I, I love the pledge uh, not to make it more difficult. So that's great. Um, one final note, I also think it's good for insurtechs to think exactly how do I want to collaborate with incumbent insurers? Um, because one size doesn't fit all. You know, some of them, yes, is a classical supplier client type of relationship but you can also have other types of partnerships and you can even move up all the way to an outright investment and I think having your mind set a little bit on with whom do I want to go for what kind of option and knowing that everything doesn't have to be the same is also a good 
exercise to do before you knock on that door. So thank you for that. Uh, and thank you all for today. It's been an absolute pleasure to, to talk to each of you collectively and for sharing your experiences and your thoughts and insights on how ensure tech and innovation can actually help accelerate the market as well, regardless of that, that line of business. So it's really been a pleasure uh, to participate and I hope that we can actually meet up face to face in EC3 or 4 very, very soon. So thank you all once again.